Hello, welcome everybody to episode 101 of the No Normal Show for Thursday, April 22nd, brought to you by Revive Health. This is our weekly deep dive into how hospital and health system marketers can navigate what we call the No Normal. I'm Chris Bevelo, health systems practice lead at Revive Health and your host for the show. I am joined by Chase Kleckner, who is senior marketing manager at Revive Health and our show's producer. Hello, Chase. Hi, Chris. Excited about today's conversation. Yeah, it's going to be a great day. We have two guests with us. The first is Wendell Potter. If you don't know Wendell, Wendell is a former health insurance executive, New York Times bestselling author, healthcare and campaign finance reform advocate, and authority on corporate and special interest propaganda. He leads two healthcare reform advocacy nonprofits, the Center for Health and Democracy and Business Leaders for Healthcare Transformation, and is the founder of Tarbell.org, a nonprofit journalism organization. In addition, he has testified before several U.S. Senate, House, and state legislative panels on how health insurance companies, in their quest to meet Wall Street profit expectations, contribute not only to the rising number of uninsured and underinsured Americans, but also to unsustainable health system costs. Wendell's books include Deadly Spin, an insurance company insider speaks out on how corporate PR is killing healthcare and deceiving Americans, which has sold over 100,000 copies (laughs) <laughs> which is notable because the average nonfiction business book sells about 400 copies a year. Uh, I will talk about it in a second. Also, Obamacare, what's in it for me, what everyone needs to know about the Affordable Care Act, and Nation on the Take, how big money corrupts our democracy and what we can do about it. And if I was to take all that and boil it down, Wendell, I would simply say you're an outspoken voice for good in this world and a personal hero of mine. So I'm so thrilled to have you on the show. Welcome. Oh, thanks. thanks very much, Chris. Thank you very much. Glad to be on the show. Yeah, cannot wait to dig in. I, I raised this before. It's all earmarked and bent pages. My wife gave me this book. Um, she has been in the nonprofit charitable side of healthcare uh, and has much to say about insurance companies, as you would imagine, and how they think about mental health. She gave this to me about 10 years ago now. And so um, I have been following you for quite some time. So, so glad you're here. Thank you. All right. We also have Brandon. Let's move on. No. <laughs> Perfect. You guys know Brandon. Brandon is the CEO and founder of Revive Health, uh, who also has worlds of experience in this space, 27 years to be exact, both in healthcare and integrated marketing, uh, actually comes from uh, a side of this business way back when uh, that focused a lot on dealing with payers. Uh, and so is also one of the nation's experts in this space. So um, we're killing it today with our guest, Brandon, welcome again. Thank you. So we've got so much to cover. Can't wait to get in. Got to get through a couple of housekeeping notes really quickly. If you're new to this show, this is where we share industry trends, research stories, anything we can get our hands on that will help you, our audience, health system marketers and communicators navigate what we call the no normal successfully. If you want to know more about what that means, Chase will be sharing a link to a blog post that explains the no normal, some of the principles, how to navigate it. Um, You can find that in the chat function of Zoom if you're attending live. Also, if you're attending live, use that chat function to talk to other folks uh, who are attending. It's a great place to have a conversation on the side as you listen to all of us. But if you have a question for Wendell or for Brandon or myself or Chase, Put that in the Q&A function of Zoom. That's what we monitor to look for questions. We'll be certainly taking questions at the end uh, of the show, but as we go through, we may also pull forward some of the questions. So make sure you put those in the Q&A function. And remember, whether you're with us live or you are tuning in some other way, uh, you can subscribe to this as a podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And also by the end of today, we, we, we post a recording of the video of this show. Uh, You can find that at thinkrevivehealth.com slash no dash normal. And also if you're interested in any of our COVID-19 content, you can find that at thinkrevivehealth.com slash COVID-19. All right, let me take a breath. That was a lot of housekeeping. Uh, Let's just get into this. Let's let's hear first of our, from our special guests, first of all, from our special guest, Wendell, uh, before we dive into the content that we want to talk about, which includes your insights on what's happening today, the trust survey that we have, the trust index that we want to talk about, just share with folks, Wendell, 
your journey. Take a few minutes for those who may not be familiar with you to kind of talk about where you've been, uh, what you've been up to and why. Well, thanks a lot, Chris. I appreciate that. I, I'm from Tennessee. I grew up in the eastern part of the state uh, and uh, became a journalist. It was my, what I wanted to do in my, fir in my first career. I was a newspaper reporter, uh, first in Memphis and then Nashville. I covered uh, the state government in, in Nashville for a few years and then had a chance to go to Washington to cover Congress and the White House and the Supreme Court for Scripps Howard newspapers. And it's a great, great career, but I was kind of enticed into communications work, uh, PR work, marketing work, and I ultimately uh, uh, wound up working for a health system in East Tennessee, the East Tennessee Baptist Hospital, it was a Baptist Health System of East Tennessee, which uh, since I left was long ago uh, absorbed into another system, but it was a, a regional healthcare system based in Knoxville. And uh, I led the advertising and public relations department there. And then I was re recruited to Humana uh, and was there for four years. At that time, Humana was known principally as a hospital company. And I was recruited to support the hospital side of the company. And while I was there, the, the company decided to spin off the hospitals to focus on managed care. I stayed with the company as a managed care company uh, for a while, but then I was recruited to Cigna and uh, was at Cigna overall uh, there about 15 years and uh, rose up through the ranks to ultimately head the corporate communications department there. And I, uh, among other things, I handle financial communications for the company. Worked very closely, not only with the CEO, but the CFO, the investor relations department. My name was on all the earnings reports for 10 years, uh, but I also had an orientation to Washington. Uh, in addition to also serving as the company's chief spokesman, I worked with my peers across the country uh, and other, other companies with our trade association and uh, often forming coalitions. The purpose of all of those was to push back against any kind of reforms, healthcare reforms we didn't like, whether we were talking about in Washington or a state capital. So I, I, I had a unique perspective uh, in my career at Cigna from seeing how these companies make money, uh, what they do, uh, what, what the experience is like for many of the customers of the company. Um, my, my department was uh, the, the, the department that had to handle what we referred to as high profile cases or uh, when, when, when people would be denied care and it would reach the media, we would have to be engaged on that. Um, so I, I, I spent many years uh, uh, dealing with a lot of the issues of, of insurance companies and, and uh, got some insights that were very valuable. I went back home to visit family in it was 2007, and uh, I, at that time, we were anticipating that Congress would take up health care reform again, certainly after the next election in 2008, and certainly if, de if the Democrat won that election. So I was tasked with putting together a white paper uh, to try to persuade the public and policymakers that the problem of the uninsured wasn't that much of a big deal, uh, that people in many cases were uninsured by choice. Uh, I knew that wasn't necessarily true, and I was struggling with that, that paper, uh, but it needed to make that point. And while I was visiting family, I read about something called a healthcare expedition uh, that was being held at a county fairground pretty close to where I grew up. I'd been to many uh, county fairs in my day when I was growing <laughs> up in Tennessee. So I, you know, my vision of a county fair was a place to go and have fun and, and hear some country music and, and see prize cows. Uh, but when I went to the Wise County Fairground, instead I saw people who were lined up by the hundreds waiting to get care in animal stalls. Uh, it was a pop-up medical clinic operated by Remote Area Medical, which uh, was formed in the 80s to fly doctors to remote parts of the world. Um, but they started getting calls from uh, communities in this country asking if they would bring these um, expeditions to to their communities and, and now remote area medical still goes on and still mm -hmm. uh, serves primarily communities in this country. Uh, the need is still as, as big, if not bigger than it ever was. When I saw what was going on, it just shook me to the core. And I realized that if I hadn't been lucky, 
I could have been one of those people uh, standing in, in one of those lines. And I also knew that what I was doing for a living was, I, I had to accept some responsibility for it because a big part of my job was to perpetuate a system that has become extraordinarily profitable for health insurance companies. And uh, I also knew that what I was doing for a living was the exact opposite of what I tried to do when I was a journalist. Uh, I, I never tried to mislead anyone knowingly uh, to leave something out, to obscure some important fact. Uh, but I, I, I had to come to accept that that's what I was doing all too often. So I ultimately, uh, uh, it was such a crisis of conscience that I, I really couldn't go on. It took me a bit longer. It wasn't immediately that I turned in my notice, but, and there were some other things that happened, but uh, I eventually just couldn't do it anymore. And I left without anything else to lined up. Uh, uh, and sure enough, healthcare reform uh, did, uh, you know, the debate did start. I thought I would just reach out uh, behind the scenes to help advocates to understand how the insurance industry really operates and, and what the industry will be doing to try to derail reform. Um, ultimately, I was told that if I really wanted to make a difference, I should consider going public. And, and I had that opportunity. I was invited to testify before a Senate Commerce Committee hearing in June of 2009. Um, I was very scared. I used to cover hearings like that, but I ultimately was convinced that, um, that I should do it. Uh, and it, I knew it would change my life and it did. Uh, I have no regrets, uh, but I have been called a whistleblower in many cases since then, uh, because I did try to pull the curtains back to help policymakers understand things that they never heard from lobbyists, uh, never heard from the PR people of these companies. And uh, that, that began my my journey to uh, be a continuing critic of our system of financing healthcare in this country through increasingly for-profit health insurance companies. Yeah, it's just incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I would encourage people, even though your book uh, came out in, was it 2010? Deadly Spin, the first one? Came out one? of 2010, that's right. Yeah, um, I would encourage people if they haven't read it to still read it. I mean, we're 11 years along, a lot has changed, uh, but a lot hasn't changed, unfortunately. And I think it's, it's still just really important to understand what's going on. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, but I would just encourage people if they have not read Deadly Spin, it's kind of a must read from my perspective if you're in this business. Thank you. You're in the business of healthcare. Okay, so thank you for that. Talk a little bit about your perspective on health insurance companies today. What do you what do you see from where you're sitting and where do you think they're trying to go um, as businesses? The companies that I worked for were very big companies when I, when I was in the industry. They have become massively bigger. Uh, I was even surprised to find just uh, recently that CVS Health, which now owns Aetna, is the fifth largest company in the United States. And United Health is now the seventh largest. And Cigna is not far behind. Uh, they have become huge. Uh, and I managed the communications around a number of acquisitions when I was at Cigna. But uh, the acquisitions have continued and they've changed. They were more horizontal back when I was there, but they've become vertical. And the companies uh, now are, are very diverse. Uh, the, the integration has been vertical. Uh, CVS being a you know, retailer and a PBM. Uh, Cigna merged with or acquired Express Scripts. Uh, of course, uh, United Health has its own huge... Uh, division that operates a PBM, Optum. Uh, so these companies have, have gotten their tentacles deeper into healthcare delivery uh, than, they, than they had been when I was there. Uh, United uh, is now the largest uh, employer of physicians in the country with over 50,000 physicians on payroll or as part of the company. And they announced early this year that they plan to bring on 10,000 more. Um, so they, they've changed. Uh, they're not just uh, insurers. In fact, uh, in many cases, that was always a misnomer. They are payers, but not necessarily insurers. And uh, they're, they're, the mix of their membership has changed a lot, too. Uh, United uh, announced uh, first quarter earnings recently. So did Anthem. So I was looking at United's earnings. and I've seen this trend over, over a few years now. Their commercial membership has been dropping, uh, but their, uh, their membership and their government plans has been increasing. Uh, and I was actually quite startled to see that in the first quarter of this year, 
uh, the uh, U.S. revenues for United Healthcare, 72% came from government payers, um, uh, not from the commercial side. So, uh, and, and we saw a huge drop in their commercial membership. Again, it's been a trend that's been going on. It wasn't just during the pandemic, it was exacerbating the pandemic. But um, we're seeing these companies get huge, very, very big, very powerful, and extraordinarily profitable. They've had uh, their most profitable year. The most profitable year was during the pandemic. And United's uh, earnings were 44% 44 higher in the first quarter of this year compared to the first three months of last year. Yeah, this is incredible. Brandon, did you want to add anything to that in your perspective before we get into the trust index? No, I think that's, I mean, that's terrific. I've got some questions for later on, but. Okay, so let's talk about the trust index. Um, Brandon, why don't you just give us some background on it, uh, kind of set up what we're talking about, uh, and then we'll dive in a little bit more specifically to get the viewpoint from both you and Wendell yeah. on what some of the findings say. Yeah, so we we started the, um, the trust survey 12 years ago, and um, at the time, there really wasn't any survey that tested the level of trust between providers and health plans, right? Like we, ha we had this sort of idea that uh, at the root of a lot of the problems in healthcare are a fundamental mistrust between the pillar B2B parties. Uh, and actually, I think we would be hard pressed to find other industries where that's the case. In, uh, in most industries, they're either very well regulated or there are existing B2B norms that drive trust levels between the parties around 70%. That's considered sort of a healthy level of trust. So our first year, we, we went to hospital providers and said, tell us who, who are the health plans you do business with, and then let's rate them on three measures of trust. Um, and, uh, and we'll unpack those in a few minutes here. And it was really interesting. I mean, not unexpectedly, it came back pretty dismal. Um, but the why was pretty important. And there was, a, there was a lot of it that was really around whether um, people honored their word, whether they felt like they were behaving in good faith, whether they followed through on promises, you know, a lot of things that, that we would probably say are like, these are the things we learned in kindergarten, right? Is sort of how to, how to behave. Um, and, um, and so over the years, over the last 12 years, we've fielded multiple versions of this. We've kept sort of the core three questions um, honesty, reliability, and fairness, which again, we'll unpack here in a minute. Um, but we then started um, making it bi-directional. We asked health plans how they would rate the providers they do business with. And we did that in different categories, big for-profit health systems, nonprofit health systems, children's hospitals, physician groups, whatever it was. Uh, and, and not surprisingly, um, payers trust providers a whole lot more than providers trust payers. Uh, which to me is a sort of a signal of a power dynamic uh, that, that's a little bit off. I can trust anybody I completely control, right? Like that's, <laughs> that's, that's very easy. Um, we have tested that level of trust between with employers and their trust in the system. We've tested it with consumers. We've tested it with physicians. And we've developed this really interesting kind of 360 degree view of the B2B trust environment, as well as then consumers trust in the system, which is also pretty rough. Now, this was pre-COVID, right? We've, we've not done consumer trust in the system during or post-COVID, but we updated our survey. We do about every 12 months. We updated our survey very late last year uh, and went back to our core audience providers because our, our hope was payers were doing all kinds of things to help providers during COVID and we just hadn't heard it. That was the that was my like naive secret hope, right? That maybe it's actually getting better and we just, it, we just haven't heard it yet. We hear all the bad things, but not the good things. Um, well, no, not the case. And if, what do they say? Crisis does not create character, it reveals it. Um, I, I think that COVID definitely revealed the character of the health plan industry and particularly as it relates to how health plans work with and, and support providers and consumers, which we can then dig into at a more detailed level. Um, and for the first time, we shared it with an actual expert in this stuff, um, Wendell, to also go through and offer his observations on this, because you know, he has a very different perspective, a very helpful perspective for us in understanding how the consumer sees a lot of this, but also maybe where some of the roots of that mistrust come from, uh, which is 
again, how do you fix a problem if you can't diagnose it and if you can't acknowledge that there is a problem in the first place? All right, so let's dive in a little bit to, to what we found. I know there's there's three key findings we want to talk to. Brandon, you want to lead us through that and and uh, invite Wendell in where it's appropriate? Yeah, so I mean, I think the the, the things that I would focus in on, and, and we can certainly um, share this information directly, but it's also available at uncovered.health, um, which we'll, we'll talk a, a little bit more about on this call. Um, but yeah, I think the, the first is, if again, if, if crisis reveals character doesn't create it, the hope was that there would be really great um, uh, change in the dynamic during COVID, right? That in a moment of crisis, consumer crisis and provider crisis, the industry would rally to solve the problems and we would suspend rules and, and people would uh, get along better and work more closely together for the common good. And instead, it's the single largest one year drop in trust we have ever experienced in, in 12 years. Um, so, so you had a system, unfortunately, that went exactly the opposite direction, that uh, providers report that payers have been more difficult than ever, that they did little or nothing, with some exceptions and some, and some notable exceptions in certain states, particularly with nonprofit blues, um, that, uh, that, that payers essentially took it as an opportunity to ratchet pressure on providers instead of stepping into the gap and helping them. And, and you'll see it as we unpack honesty, reliability, and fairness, I think, in a sort of frightening way. Um, these are the worst scores we've ever seen in, in all those categories across the board with huge changes year over year, huge drops year over year. Um, and, and this is not an anecdotal survey. This, um, the people that we survey represent about 40% of the hospitals in America. So it's a very representative sample. If anything, it may skew a little bit larger, right? A little bit larger, more sophisticated, and therefore uh, in a stronger position with plans, um, which, which makes this even more terrifying. Um, but um, but, but the, the fairness score in particular was really, really rough. Um, I think the, the last is that we've really found kind of three major areas that are driving this trust problem. I mean, there is the, the sort of anecdotal hospitals put their business plans on pause. They stopped doing elective surgery. The payers were making money hand over fist. The Wendell's point was profitable year ever for health plans. They didn't do anything to step in the gap. They may have exacerbated that pressure. Um, we could point to a lot of those things, right? Flattening of rate trend and all kinds of stuff. But really three things are driving this dissatisfaction. One is policy changes, unilateral policy changes by a health plan against a hospital that results in the hospital being paid materially less than they expected to be paid when they signed their contract. So these are characterized as policy or administrative changes. The second is altered language. Uh, health plans unilaterally altering language in their provider manuals, and again, making changes that fundamentally reduce how much providers are paid for care, and we could get into white, brag white bagging and brown bagging and infusion services and radiology in a hospital environment and uh, you know, post-ED visit determination of whether you actually had an emergency. I mean, there's a hundred of these things that are f terrifying in a lot of ways, um, but, but I think a lot of that falls into sort of policy change or altered language. And then the last is just in claims denials. So we can just pause for a moment and recognize how incredibly perverse this is, right? That when hospitals are putting patients in the, in the garage, right, to take care of them during COVID, you had health plans that are still coming in and doing retrospective chart analysis of COVID patients and then denying payment for, for that. Uh, and this is not anecdotal. This is pretty, pretty consistent. So um, what we saw is a huge surge in claims denials with very little explanation and therefore withholding of payment that was pretty critical to those providers during and, and now you know, coming up on post COVID. So those three things, as bad as the environment was before, all have really been, had sort of gasoline poured on them. And as a result have you know, some really significant provider and consumer dissatisfaction that resulted from it. Yeah, Wendell, what, what, what's your take on all that? I wasn't surprised to see those results because I had been hearing evidence that, that this was uh, likely to be what would show up in a, in, a, in a survey like this. Primarily, I was hearing from doctors and, uh, and physician groups about payer behavior. 
uh, and I learned that some of these big uh, insurers were, for example, uh, giving provider groups, and in particular hospital-based uh, uh, doctors, uh, ER doctors, anesthesiologists, radi radi radiologists, essentially an ult ultimatum saying, um, this is what, how we're going to cut our, your reimbursement. If you don't like it, then you'll go out of network. Uh, and this was at the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, I began hearing from doctors who were saying, can you believe this? And uh, United in particular was, uh, was a company that was apparently most aggressive in doing this. Uh, and I have also observed over the last two or three years uh, how these companies have become uh, uh, even more obsessed, I guess, in meeting shareholders' expectations or meeting profit margins and some of the things that they're doing to, to assure that they're meeting those expectations. I've, I've observed uh, more aggressive prior authorization requirements uh, and know the burden that that places on, on providers uh, and provider staff and the cost uh, and uh, the resulting delay uh, in treatment uh, for a lot of patients. I'm aware of, of how they change networks, uh, how they uh, reduce the size of the networks uh, or just change it. And uh, this goes back, it seems like we're seeing something sort of like what I saw in the early days at, at Cigna when, uh, and, and the beginnings of these companies really running the managed care show uh, that uh, the big insurers would, we call it blowing up the network. Uh, and if we thought that uh, a hospital or a provider group uh, uh, wasn't uh, uh, doing what we thought they should, should do, we would throw them out of the network and just blow it up. Uh, and, and, the, and the big insurers had that kind of power. And, they, and once again, we're seeing they're using that kind of power. The other is uh, jacking up uh, premiums, not only premiums, but out-of-pocket cost uh, to exorbitant uh, levels that uh, the, the, the result is that patients uh, are, are having more and more difficult, uh, difficulty getting care uh, from the doctors and hospitals that they prefer and being able to afford it. Yeah, I mean, to that point, Wendell, um, my, my family out of pocket max is $13,000, I think, mm. which is a modest family sedan, right? Yeah. <laughs> would, would be the cumulative costs I would be expected right. to bear, God forbid, someone in our family got sick. But yeah, yeah I, I do think, you know, Wendell mentioned United, and we've mentioned him several times, and, and there's reason for that, right? One, because I think in, in many ways, the strategies that we see other payers employ tend to draft on the industry leaders. And United is very clearly an industry, well, leader is a tough phrase. They are out in front of a number of these trends, whether it's vertical integration, whether it's you know, kind of excessive uh, uh, PBM uh, drug rebates to their PBM, whether it's transfer pricing to entities that they own. But I think we, I have to just mention a couple of these numbers because they are so startling. This is on a one to a hundred scale, right? So let's remember sort of 70, 75 is a healthy trust level in a bit of B2B environment. United's reliability score was 29. United's honesty score was 29. And let's just say for the sake of argument, that score could be really high and you could still hate someone, right? You could say like, they are very, very honest with me and I still despise them. Um, but no, 29, 29. And then fairness is the one that really triggers and on, for United, again, on a one to hundred scale, it's 19. I mean, I, I, I would submit that if any of our kids performed that way, we'd be talking about holding them back, right? Like let's, maybe we need to repeat sixth grade here. I mean, it's just, these are, these are startling and these are not temporary numbers. This represents a 34% year over year drop for United from 2019 to the end of 2020 in the midst of the COVID crisis, core trust factors declined by a third. I mean, that's, not just statistically significant, it's huge movement. And, and they're not alone in that. You know, if you, you, you look at people like Cigna who score pretty well on reliability and honesty, take a big dip on fairness below 50, right? So, you know, we, we only have, we have zero payers with a fairness rating above 50 in the survey. I mean, that, that's a problem, I think, for the industry when one party feels fundamentally taken advantage of by another. The power dynamic is off. The industry can't operate properly for consumers and for purchasers of insurance and healthcare services in that. 
So I, I just want to ask both of you guys, and I know we have more to share in the trust index, but just from a really somebody who's not nearly as deep into all of this as, as both of you are, but you know, you hear all the time the reason we have the system we have with health insurers is primarily because their job is to keep costs down. That's the argument you hear, you know, just out in like the business trades, forget about our industry. Um, but hey, imagine what would happen if we didn't have the health insurers where costs would go. That's that's their values. They keep it down. Yet, if if we're talking about expanded vertical integration, where they're actually to have more to Wendell's point, more physicians, United is more physicians employed than any other group. If we're talking about the PBMs, like good luck for any of us to try to figure out <laughs> how the money's working there, but it's probably not keeping costs down in the way that people would expect um, or the shareholder value window, which you've been talking about for a long time. They've got to drive shareholder value. Mm -hmm. If they, if they are a public company or even private, I guess, but they're mostly public. Uh, that's what they're there to do. How can they, with a straight face, continue to say, given all of that, our job is to keep costs down? Because at some point, you can only drain so much blood from a turnip. I, I just, that argument just seems to break down when you hear a lot of this. It does break down. Uh, I think uh, they've done such an exceptionally good job of, I used to say it, bamboozling the public and, uh, and, and policymakers that there's still this belief that they, are, they exist to, uh, to manage healthcare costs. Uh, when the reality is they don't, they frankly don't have, especially now, an incentive to bring costs down uh, when they've become such big providers themselves through uh, acquiring physician practices and operating their own PBMs and just getting deeper into healthcare uh, on the provider side. Uh, they've never really had a, a, a real incentive to hold costs down. Uh, they talk a good game to their employer customers, but as healthcare costs go up, they're able to demand more from their customers in higher premiums. So that's how the game keeps, keeps going on. Um, uh, a few years ago, a few, maybe a couple of years before I left Cigna, I was in a leadership meeting in which the, uh, someone asked the CEO what kept him up at night. And he said, uh, disintermediation, that someday uh, their, their, their uh, employers and others might wake up to see that they're not necessarily essential uh, and begin to question their value proposition to use a jargony term. Uh, I think we may be getting to the, to the point that some employers may begin to do that. But um, I've also said that they, the lever that they use most often to control healthcare cost is to try to um, reduce utilization of healthcare goods and services. Uh, and so that's what they really do and where they're most aggressive by far uh, through these barriers that I mentioned, primarily through prior authorization and uh, uh, you know, forcing people with insurance to pay so much out of their own pockets before they'll pay a dime. Uh, that depresses utilization. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say to, to Wendell's point on, um, on you know, kind of the transfer pricing piece of this, uh, the vertical integration piece of this. We've got some content coming up pretty soon on Uncovered that's going to explore that. We're going to be taking a look at some really interesting work done by Nate Kaufman and Axine, a really great actuarial firm, have developed a product that looks at this that really can measure at a state level, at a product line level, and at a national level, the amount of drug rebate by health plan, the profitability of different lines of business in within states and across the nation, uh, and, and really digging into some of that transfer pricing piece as well, because I think to Wendell's point, the, the old game used to be, we're going to control utilization with, you know, HMO style controls, which as Americans, you know, nothing like having a choice taking away from us, even if it's one we have no intention of ever exercising, right? Like we are, we jealously guard our precious choices in that. Um, that didn't work. So then there's been this focus on unit price, which is a bit, a bit silly when you think about value-based care, which may explain why VBC has stalled at 13% of revenue for providers for five straight years. And I think to Wendell's point, what we're seeing now is a refocus on utilization rather than through gatekeeper and other controls, consumer-facing controls, but rather behind the scenes policy and administrative controls. 
it's denials, it's pre-ops. I mean, we have clients in the last few months I've talked to you said, we have patients coming in who have authorizations and we're still being denied payment. That it's, there's just this fundamental belief, I think, on the health plan side that if you make it difficult enough, at some point, you won't pay the provider. And, and that, you know, I, I, hate, I hate believing that, but that's certainly what it looks and smells like when, you know, when, you're, on, when you're on the other side of it. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, I mean, I, I have some questions when we're, when we're ready for it, Chris, around Wendell's view of some of the individual um, companies and individual issues within healthcare. But, but to me, this is the central issue. If consumers are purchasing insurance, believing they're buying a network and believing they're buying certain coverage, in, in most places, they're receiving neither of those things in a consistent and reliable way. Uh, let's, let's get to those questions, Brandon, but really quick, can you just spend a minute on Uncovered? Because there may be people who are here with us or are going to listen on the podcast who may not yeah. know what you mean by Uncovered. Yeah. So I, I, first of all, I encourage anybody on the call to go to uncovered.health. Uh, it's a website that we've set up that aggregates news and content about uh, health plans nationally. So we only focus on the U.S., but on health plans nationally and on their behavior as it relates to consumers, employers, government, et cetera. So essentially we're aggregating news, we're sharing information there that'll be relevant to you, should help see trend. Uh, it, is, it is right now almost entirely third-party information other than the trust survey, but we're gonna be seeing a lot more contributed content in the coming months um, that isn't you know, just what's in the news. Since unfortunately, a lot of that is, a lot of the nuance is missed in news coverage, right? Like we report on, Un on United's earnings as though it's sport, right? It's like, it's, it's, not, it's not sport. It's, it's, it's $20 billion that'll leave the healthcare system this year that might've actually paid for a sick person or some care, right? I mean, there's, but, but I think, you know, understandably, financial media are gonna write about earnings and trajectory and all that stuff. And it's like, yeah, that's fine. But, yeah. but what do health plans do to earn that 13% of the healthcare spend? And what value is created by that? And Uncovered really seeks to, to explore that. Uh, there's also an Uncovered uh, LinkedIn profile and feed, Twitter. There's a number of ways you can access this content. Uh, and Wendell's going to be uh, helping us by contributing some content to that as well and hoping to really raise awareness of these issues on a, on a much broader level. Perfect. So I know you said you had some questions for Wendell. So why don't you throw some of those out? Yeah, so, so we've talked about United a lot because they're fun to talk about um, it, if the behavior isn't always fun. I'm, I'm really curious, you know, you, you spent a long time at Cigna and uh, you watched the industry closely. Do, do you feel like um, Cigna is, a, and I'll, I'll have questions about others just to be clear, I don't want to just pick on Cigna, but do you feel like it's a fundamentally different company or has fundamentally different or better values and behaviors than you saw when you were there? I think it is a, a fundamentally different, fundamentally different company than than when I was there. Um, I, 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 on the other hand, uh, uh, looking back over my career, I can see that the company, in some ways, hasn't changed. Uh, the, the uh, but it's you know, these were both the companies I work for are for-profit companies that are their stock is traded in the New York Stock Exchange, and 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 by the way that they do business, the way they're legally structured, they're number one objective is to enhance shareholder value. That's how they see the world. And when you're in the executive suite, that's what you talk about. Um, so I don't think necessarily it has changed in that regard, but I think that what we are seeing and, and one of the reasons for the vertical integration in particular is um, that they're seeing that they're, the marketplace has changed a lot. Uh, the, they're, they're not, the growth is not in, on the commercial side. And even when I was at Cigna, uh, the discussion often was stealing market share from competitors because the, the, the commercial market is, has been stagnant for a long time. Uh, so the emphasis in more recent years has been uh, getting money from government payers, uh, which I alluded to earlier. Uh, so it, it's changed. And there's a, uh, the other thing that has changed is as they have grown, they've gotten immensely more uh, powerful and resourceful. They spend enormous amounts of money on lobbying uh, and public relations campaigns. Just uh, this week, I saw that uh, AHIP uh, spent more money during the first quarter on lobbying than in its history. <laughs> uh, and Centene did as well, 80% uh, spike in, in spending. And part of it is it, it largely to uh, you know, protect uh, 
a status quo that has become extraordinarily profitable for them. So in that regard, I don't think that's changed. They've just, they're just bigger and have even more power. I've often said that uh, uh, you know, they, they all, they're very good at pointing the finger of blame at providers, at drug companies, at hospital companies or hospitals and, uh, uh, and physician groups. These are the real drivers of healthcare costs is what I used to say and what they would still say. Uh, but, um, uh, and, but that also belies what, then why do we keep them around if, they're, if their purpose is to control healthcare costs, but they're pointing the finger at providers? Why hasn't someone caught onto that game <laughs> before now? But um, uh, they, uh, as they have gotten bigger because of the uh, first the horizontal and now the, the vertical integration, uh, they have immense, immense power, more so, I guess, than... Uh, uh, than, than providers uh, in, in, in any time in history. But that, has, that consolidation on the insurance side, I would argue, fueled the consolidation, the mergers and acquisitions on the provider side uh, as almost inevitable uh, uh, and necessary for hospital systems to be able to have anywhere close to a level playing field. It, this yeah. is just, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Brad. I was just gonna say, for, especially for those of you that are in marketing and in, communications at hospitals and health systems. What Wendell's talking about now is just so important to understand. We have been tracking, we call it the value crisis. What we mean by that, Wendell, is um, hospitals and health systems, before COVID, we saw this real acceleration of blame being cast upon hospitals and health systems. It's always been there to your point, but boy, did it ramp up. And then COVID hit and all of a sudden, you know, hospitals and health systems were heroes for quite some time. So it kind of put it on pause. But it even started to seep back in at the end of last year, and now we're starting to hear it again. And this is so important because this is your reputation. This is your brand, essentially. And if you're responsible for your brand, you're going to have to understand how to combat this because more and more the spotlight is being shown on you as the problem. It's it, it, Traditionally, it's often been you know, the bad guys have been pharma. They've been payers. Mm -hmm. um, but now, you know, not coincidentally, Hospitals were being put in that spotlight. There's a quote, and I'll never remember who it was from or what reporter, but we can find out and provide later, talking about how, hey, this is this is right. Like hospitals, they really are um, the center and the problem for the cost here. And the quote she said was something like, I suppose you could argue that hospitals add value because they provide care, <laughs> as if like what like that was an open question <laughs> compared to the payers where you're like what value are they i mean there is no healthcare system without providers like that is the yeah. service that is the thing um i mean that's how bad it is out there yeah. that the folks look at it through that lens so i just i wanted to interject for those folks um that's why this is so important to understand um so anyway brandon go ahead did you have another yeah I, I was just going to add one point to this i think it's it, it, I think a lot of times we accuse people of the sins we commit, right? Like it, it, it makes us feel better somehow if I can divert attention onto your problems instead of my problems. And I, and I think that pairs have done an extraordinary job of pointing to provider consolidation as the villain. Yes. And, to, and to Wendell's point, we all forget that health plans consolidated, there were 400 healthcare health plan transactions in the 90s, 400 acquisitions in the 90s. There have never been more than 120 or so hospital acquisitions in any given year. And most of those have been rural acquisitions, dying rural hospital acquisitions yeah. by larger urban medical centers. But I mean, if if we go and look at the herfindahl hirschman index, which I really wish they would read. Wow. So I didn't wow. say that. I'm impressed. Um, it is so, the, the health plan industry is one of the most consolidated industries in America, not just in healthcare. I mean, the, the level of consolidation and plans will say, well, you don't understand these uber powerful hospital groups are dictating price and they're, you know, they're in control of the system and poor us, you know, we're just fighting for relevance. It's like, my God, I, I, I've been doing this 25 years. That's never been true. That has never been true in any sector of healthcare. You know, hospitals are by and large price takers from health plans. They have to be. Health plans control the only profitable volume that they see, right? They lose money on the uninsured, they lose money on Medicaid, they lose money on Medicare. And that little slice of commercial business is the difference between successful and bankrupt hospitals. 
And the idea that hospitals are pushing around health plans is that's the, ac that's the accusation, right? The sin I accuse you of is the sin I commit. Health plans accuse hospitals of driving market power through consolidation when the only reason they're consolidating is to survive. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's sort of a crazy narrative that's been created in some ways. Yeah. I want to I want to ask um, pulling some of the questions because I know we're at forty five minutes after and um, there are some questions so I want to pull some in here and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on one Wendell because I, I I'm pretty sure I I've heard you speak about this related to what you know about the insurance industry uh, and the public option and a little bit of the spin that's been put on that uh, and the question the question has come in is essentially what what is the what are the odds that there will be a public option? And it's framed in a, in a way that says, look, you can talk about politics here, but we also have folks that you would typically assume that the Democratic Party is the one that would be up for the, for the public option. Yet you can look at a lot of the leadership that's taken plenty of lobbyist money from the insurance industry. You know, is this, is this ever going to happen? Does it ever have a chance? I, I, I'm curious. I, I'm wondering if it, if it can as well. Uh, uh, by the way, as, as you may know, it's not just in Washington. Some state lawmakers are trying to enact or create uh, or establish state-based public options. And what I'm seeing is the insurance industry, in particular, trying to, uh, you know, playing whack-a-mole, trying to make sure that it doesn't happen in Hartford or Denver or wherever else it might be. Uh, they have such such power. And to your point. Uh, they, they donate uh, uh, to Democrats as well as Republicans, and they don't want a public option. They, uh, and I did in my, in my old days, talk about the importance of choice and competition. It was very Orwellian the way we used it, uh, but they absolutely do not want to have another competitor, certainly not one that uh, might demonstrate that uh, uh, you can provide coverage at less cost and uh, not saddle people with high deductibles and not uh, play uh, mother may I through prior authorization as much as we see now. Uh, so they will, they will fight it uh, to the nth degree. Uh, they did 10 years ago. Uh, it almost was a part of the Affordable Care Act until the almost the 11th hour mm -hmm. that they, they knew you know, what, what to do to, to get it stripped out. And you know, I think ultimately there will be enough of uh, an, an awareness of bad behavior on part of providers, or excuse me, uh, of payers that uh, uh, politicians may may begin to take notice. But because of all of the money that they spend to influence elections and public policy, policy, I'm I I have to say I'm not terribly optimistic it's, it's going to happen anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, you gotta. I I think. However you feel about it from a policy standpoint, I, I think you have to look at how government has funded healthcare in general and, and not feel real good about that in terms of long-term sustainability, right? That yeah. the average hospital loses about 40 cents on every, on, on every dollar of, of Medicaid patient they treat and, you know, give or take about 15 cents of every dollar on every Medicare patient. So if we really went to something like a Medicare for all, within some number of years, the provider system available to us doesn't look anything like it does today. I mean, they're just, they're, it, could, it couldn't survive. So I, I'm I'll probably betray my own leanings here. I'm not a big, not a big government guy as it relates to, to healthcare generally. Um, I, I think public option to be fair is a little different, right, than, than Medicare for all, but it only works right if they fund it right. And I've just not had a ton of confidence on how government has funded healthcare in the past. I would, I would I would agree with that. It's 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 it, it all details matter, and and how a public option should be structured makes all the difference. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna one more question here, um, and I'm gonna paraphrase a question that came in from the audience, um, and the the questioner is talking about his disappointment as a physician um, with some of the associations that support the provider side. I won't name them. Um, you can guess what some of the bigger ones are. Uh, but I think his, his question is, um, he would have expected more, more in a collective way from the provider side to combat what we're, what we're talking about here. Um, why haven't we seen more? 
I mean, I, I feel like, you know, Wendell, you have through your career, um, you know, since you published your book, really pointed out how insurance companies um, singularly and, and collectively have created this narrative, different narratives. Um, we don't really see that as strongly on the provider side. No. No. Can both of you kind of speak to why not and, and what could be done to change that? Yeah, I'll start. And I think I was certainly I had an advantage when I was uh, working for these big companies. These companies are national companies. They have a national brand. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was, through my job, able to go to New York and have lunch with a Wall Street Journal reporter or a New York Times reporter. Uh, if I were just, uh, you know, even a large, if, a, you know, representing a large regional health system, I probably wouldn't have that kind of access. And I could do the same, you know, have the same kind of, of access to, in Washington. Uh, uh, that's part of it. Uh, we, I think insurers are able because they're national players and now even bigger than they were when I was there uh, to have that kind of influence. I, most of, much of my job was, was day in and day out working to develop good close relationships with influent, influential folks, whether it's in the media or, or public policy. And um, I don't think you've, you've got, you haven't seen that, maybe not even the ability to do that as, as, uh, as, in, as insurance companies can do, as payers can do. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I, I, um, I'll, I'll speak. Um, I'll, I'll speak by the topic I'm more comfortable with or more fluent with is the AHA side than the AMA side. You know, and I think on the AHA side, we do have to give a little bit of credit that I think AHA really stepped up for members during COVID. I think whether that was on the stimulus side, whether that was on PPP, whether that's been more recently asking for DOJ intervention and United's acquisition of change. Um, you know, there, there have been a, a number of things. And, and I think to Wendell's point, let's just pause for a moment and consider how complex and often contradictory are the needs of a hospital membership for AHA. What a small rural hospital needs versus what an academic needs versus a big multi-state IDN is, you know, in many cases, they're not just difficult to align. They're actually at odds with one another. And so that, that's a very difficult policy agenda to carry forward. Whereas I think to, to Wendell's point, you have a lot fewer health plans and a lot more in common in what their needs and desires are, which really at this point is just a stymie competition, I think, and, you know, and to exert greater power over the system. I think the AMA side might be a little different. You know, I think we've heard a lot of physicians are really unhappy with what they perceive as AMA's lack of advocacy during COVID. Um, we're obviously seeing a huge shift in, uh, to a hospital employment of physicians. Uh, which ironically is one of the things contributing significantly to hospital losses, uh, since hospitals lose about a quarter million dollars on every doctor they employ. You know, these are these are important trends, and that's not factored into Medicare's analysis of hospital profitability, which is a whole different problem. Um, but I, you know, I I think maybe the dissatisfaction uh, is a little bit more on the physician side than the AHA side. You know, hospitals are always going to wish wish AHA did more. They're always going to wish their state hospital associations did more. Um, but there are a lot that do. I mean, I think we could point to North Carolina Hospital Association or Haney's or others that are very activist and very progressive on behalf of their members. Um, tougher at the national level for all the reasons Wendell said. All right. So I feel like we could just keep going on and on, but we probably ought to wrap. We're, we're almost at an hour, which, which I knew we would get to because Wendell, thank you so much. We knew you would provide all kinds of amazing stuff and absolutely you did so thanks so much for being on the show oh my pleasure thanks for having me on 100 percent, brandon as always thank you sir thank, thanks for inviting me back yeah <laughs> chase thank you yeah i really enjoyed the conversation let us know if there's something you want us to cover that we're not covering post that in the zoom chat right now if you're live otherwise shoot us an email at no normal at think next week we're interrupting our regularly scheduled show for the Joe Public All Access event. If you want to take a 90 minute oasis from COVID, from bad payer activity, and talk to us about brand and creativity and all kinds of really important things actually that you need to be thinking about differently as we start thinking about the end of the no normal, join us for that. Uh, Chase, I believe has posted something in the chat that gives you access to that. Otherwise visit our website and you can find out about that. Uh, we've already got some amazing folks who have signed up to join. It's always a great conversation. So, so come join us next Thursday if you can. Remember to go to thinkrevivehealth.com 
slash COVID-19 for recording of today's episode and all of our COVID related content. Subscribe on iTunes and until next week, good luck out there in the no normal. Thanks for joining.